So far, in the games released by Infocom category, we've done both Zork 1 and Zork 2 on the TRS-80 Model 1 and the TRS-80 Color Computer 2. Now, it is time for us to tackle Zork 3 together, and do it, of course, on the TRS-80 Model 1, the first microcomputer that Zork 1 was released on, which makes it the obvious choice. Zork 3 is not about the same things that Zork 1 and 2 were. In those, the player gets to run around, solve puzzles, collect treasure, and by doing so, score points. You, as the player, were an intrepid adventurer who used cunning wit and sometimes a blade or two to overcome all the obstacles thrown before you. But now, it's not about points or killing trolls and thieves. It's about proving your worth and gathering the garb required to become the dungeon master themselves. Something you do by facing challenges. Done by proving your worth, as such, score is not awarded for accomplishments, they're awarded for initiating the steps required to solve a puzzle. And this has the downside of allowing a player to have all seven possible points while never actually accomplishing anything. This game has some puzzles which have more than one solution to them, and in those solutions we will be using the solution I find most easy to use. This also means, because I like to deal with a particular section of the game first, that an in-game timer will trigger an event somewhere around turn 130, which will make one solution to a puzzle impossible, and we'll have to use another. Something I do not find too problematic, as it is good to know multiple ways to complete the game anyway. There are others, but they are not as game-changing. Now, there are 30 ways to die in Zork 3. Zork 1 had 28, so it has more. But compared to the 50 of Zork 2, it seems like a step back. This game also has a payoff to a joke that was the definition of playing a long game. Not sure if you remember Hello Sailor from Zork 1, but it comes back to haunt us, or more appropriately, gives us a simple solution to a hard puzzle. If you remember, Zork 1 sold 378,987 copies by 1986. Zork 2 sold 173,204, and in comparison, Zork 3 sold 129,200. Now that is not to say that it's a worse received game. In fact, by my research, it was received much better than Zork 2 was. Many publications and reviewers rated it as the best of the three. So let's go back to 1982 together. TRS-80, Model 1, Zork 3, using LDOS once more because my Model 1 really likes it. And together, let's become the Dungeon Master. As in a dream, you see yourself tumbling down a great, dark staircase. All about you are shadowy images of struggles against fierce opponents and diabolical traps. These give way to another round of images, of imposing stone figures, a cool, clear lake, and now, of an old yet oddly youthful man. He turns toward you slowly, his long, silver hair dancing about him in the fresh breeze. You have reached the final test, my friend. You are proved clever and powerful, but this is not yet enough. Seek me when you feel yourself worthy. The dream dissolves around you as his last words echo through the void. Zork 3, The Dungeon Master, copyright 1982 by Infocom Inc., all rights reserved. Zork is a trademark of Infocom Inc. Release 16, serial number 830410. That is April 10th, 1983. On that day, I was 13 years old. Endless stair. You're at the bottom of a seemingly endless stair, winding its way upward beyond your vision. An eerie light coming from all around you casts strange shadows on the walls. To the south is a dark winding trail. Your old friend, the Blast Lantern, is at your feet. Where we are right now is the end of Zork 2. And as you see, we have our brass lantern here, but something that is not here that we will pick up a little while into the game, in fact, very shortly, is the sword. But it will not be by picking it up ourselves. It will come to us. For those of you who have done this with me before, you remember, I like to work things through as though I'm working from a script because I've written down the path that I'm going to take in order to make it easier for us to do things and not get lost, and that way I don't forget things. However, it's not really a script as much as it is an outline that just gives me a basic idea, go here, go here, don't forget this, and make sure you mention this. 
So we're going to work with that together, and we're going to go through Zork 3. Now the first thing we need to do while we are here is get the lamp. And then we want to turn the lamp on. And we're going to go south to the junction. You're at the junction of a north-south passage and an east-west passage. To the north, you can make out the bottom of a stairway. The ways to the east and south are relatively cramped, but a wider trail leads to the west. Standing before you is a great rock. Embedded within it is an elvish sword. This is the sword that I mentioned, but we would not be able to remove it from the rock, so we're not even going to try. Instead, we're going to go west to the barren area. You are west of the junction where the rock-bound passage widens into a large flat area. Although the land here is barren, you can see vegetation to the west. South of here is a mighty wall of stone, ancient and crumbling. To the southwest, the wall has decayed enough to form an opening, through which seeps a thin mist. A trail dips sharply into the rocky terrain to the northwest. We're going to go west again. Cliff. This is a remarkable spot in the dungeon. Perhaps 200 feet above you is a gaping hole in the Earth's surface through which pours bright sunshine. A few seedlings from the world above, nurtured by the sunlight and occasional rains, have grown into giant trees, making this a virtual oasis in the desert of the underground empire. To the west is a sheer precipice, dropping nearly 50 feet to dragged rocks below. The way south is barred by a forbidding stone wall, crumbling from age. There is a jagged opening in the wall to the southwest, through which leaks a fine mist. The land to the east looks lifeless and barren. A rope is tied to one of the large trees here and is dangling over the side of a cliff, reaching down to the shelf below. It seems as if somebody has been here recently, as there is some fresh bread laying beneath the other trees. We want to get the bread. And then we're going to go down. Cliff ledge. This is a rock-strewn ledge near the base of a tall cliff. The bottom of the cliff is another 15 feet below. You have a little hope of climbing up the cliff face, but you might be able to scramble down from here, though it's doubtful you could return. A long piece of rope is dangling down from the top of the cliff, which is within your reach. A large chest, closed and locked, is lying among the boulders. If you look up to the top bar, you will notice we already have a score of one, though we haven't really done anything. We've just gotten the bread and climbed down. Now, we need to be able to get this chest out of here, and to do that, we can't do it ourselves. So we're going to use the rope by tie the rope to the chest. Now, I could go get rope and all of that, but let's just tie it to the chest. The chest is now tied to the rope, and then we want to wait. Time passes. All at once, the chest is lifted from you. Looking up, you see a man at the top of the cliff pulling intently at the rope. That is uncommonly good of you, I do say, he chuckles unpleasantly. Oh, you were stuck, aren't you? Well, I'll be right back to get you. He leaves your sight. And all we can do is wait. And wait some more. And continue waiting. A familiar voice calls down to you. Are you still there? He bellows with a coarse laugh. Well then, grab on to the rope and we'll see what we can do. The rope drops to within your reach. So we want to grab the rope. You grab securely on the rope. The man starts to heave on the rope and within a few moments you arrive at the top of the cliff. The man removes the last few valuables from the chest and prepares to leave. You've been a good sport. Here, take this for whatever good it is. I can't say that I'll be needing this one. He hands you a plain wooden staff from the bottom of the chest and begins examining his valuables. The chest, open and empty, is at your feet. So with the staff, we're going to go to the southwest. Land of Shadow. You are standing atop a steep cliff, looking over a vast ocean. Far below, the surf pounds at a sandy beach. To the south and east are rolling hills, filled with eerie shadows. A path is cut into the face of the cliff, which descends toward the beach. To the north is a tall stone wall, which ends at the cliff edge. It's obviously built long ago, and directly north is a spot where you could climb over the rubble of the decaying wall. You can hear quiet footsteps nearby. Now, we are not going to concern ourselves with the footsteps just yet. Instead, we are going to head west to the Flathead Ocean. 
You're at the north shore of an amazing underground sea, the topic of many a legend among adventurers. Few were known to have arrived at this spot and fewer to return. There is a heavy surf and a breeze is blowing on the shore. The land rises steeply to the east and quicksand prevents movement to the south. A thick mist covers the ocean and extends over the hills to the east. A path heads north along the beach. Now what we want to do here is we want to wait for a little while. We are waiting for this particular instance right here. Time passes. Passing alongside the shore now is an old boat, reminiscent of an ancient Viking ship. Standing on the prow of the ship is an old and crusty sailor, peering out over the misty ocean. And you may or may not remember from the first game, it gave us a little joke. A hello sailor. Or I should say this is the end of the joke. So we're going to say hello sailor. I can't use the word hello here. The seaman looks up and maneuvers the boat towards the shore. He cries out, I have waited three ages for someone to say those words and save me from sailing this endless ocean. Please accept this gift. You may find it useful. He throws something which falls near you in the sand and sails off toward the west, singing a lively but somewhat uncouth sailor song. The boat sails silently through the mist out of sight. So let's look. And you see now at the end here it says there is a vial here. We want to get the vial. And this is the vial of invisibility. It will help us near the end of the game, and I prefer using it instead of what can be called the mirror box solution. So now we're going to head northeast, taking us into the Land of Shadow, which is where we left earlier, and I said that we were not concerned with the sound of someone walking nearby. Now we are concerned with someone walking nearby, and we're looking for someone who is a cloaked figure. And in order to find them, we need to move around the Land of Shadow. So we're going to go and just walk around a bit. This is completely random. We're going to go east. Oh, lucky us. You are in the shadowy land of low, rolling hills stretching out to the west and south. The land is bordered to the north by a massive stone wall. Ancient and weathered, the wall is crumbled enough at one point to permit passage. Through the shadows, a cloaked and hooded figure appears before you, blocking the northwestern exit from the room and carrying a brightly glowing sword. From nowhere, the sword from the junction appears in your hand, wildly glowing. This is the sword of elvish quality, the the one through the different games that we've referred to as either sword, elvish sword, or crest, etc. And if you look at the score, you will notice it now says 2. I'm going to stop mentioning when we get scores. You'll just have to notice it on your own. But we need to fight him. We do not want to kill him. Repeat. If you are playing along with me, if you are playing this game on your own later, do not kill him. It will allow you to continue the game if you kill him, but you will not be able to complete the game. What we want to do is we want to attack the figure. Notice it says, with sword, we did not have to type that. A quick stroke, but the hooded figure is on guard. Your quick reflexes cannot stop the hooded figure's stroke. You are hit. Attack figure with sword. A good stroke, but it's too slow. Your dodge, the hooded figure, comes in low. Again. A good stroke, but it's too slow. The hooded figure stabs nonchalantly with its sword and misses. Again. The hooded figure is hit with a quick slash. The figure has a light wound, which hasn't affected its seemingly great strength. Your quick reflexes cannot stop the hooded figure's stroke. You are hit. Quick stroke catches the hooded figure off guard. Blood trickles down the figure's arm. The figure has some wounds and is probably not capable of hindering your movement. The hooded figure tries to sneak past your guard, but you twist away. Again. Quick stroke catches the hooded figure off guard. Blood trickles down the figure's arm. The figure is hurt and its strength appears to be fading. The hooded figure attempts a thrust, but its weakened state prevents it from hitting you. 
A good parry. Your sword wounds the hooded figure. The figure appears to be badly hurt and defenseless. The figure attempts a thrust, but its weakened state prevents hitting you. Now, instead of attempting to kill it, we are going to try to get some things from it. Get the hood. You slowly remove the hood from your badly wounded opponent and recoil in horror at the sight of your own face, weary and wounded. A faint smile comes to the lips, and then to the face starts to change very slowly into that of an old, wizened person. The image fades, and with it the body of your hooded opponent. The cloak remains on the ground. So let's drop the sword, because we do not need it anymore. The hood is what we were after that we could not get if we did not let him live. And this is important because you will notice the cloak remains on the ground. The game attempts to fake you out by letting you think that you actually won by leaving the cloak as a treasure for you. So you now have multiple treasures. You have the staff, the hood, and the cloak. And from here we want to go east. You're at the eastern end of a dark, featureless landscape of shallow hills. Paths to the east and southeast re-enter the rock. You want to go east again to the creepy crawl. You're in a dark and quite creepy crawlway with passages leaving to the north, east, south, and southwest. And we're going to go south to the foggy room. You're in a dank passage filled with a wispy fog. A spooky passageway leads to the north and a wider path heads off to the south. To the west, the path leaves the rock and enters an eerie shadowy land. We're not going back to the shadowy land. Instead, we're going to go south again. Lake shore. You're at a wide cavern on the north shore of a small lake. Some polished stone steps lead to the southwest and a sheer rock face prevents any movement around the lake to the southwest. The cavern is dimly lit from above. And now we are going to drop everything. Now you may be wondering why we dropped everything. It's because we are now going to go in the lake. And if we were carrying anything, we would drop it immediately. Go in lake. You are nearly paralyzed by the icy waters as you swim into the center of the lake. That's where you would drop everything. On the lake. You are floating on the surface of the lake. The water is ice cold and your ability to survive here for long is very questionable. A swim north puts you at your starting point. Conditions to the east are poor where the lake turns into a swamp. The west and south shores are suitable for walking, however. We want to go down. We can only spend a small amount of time in the lake before it kills us. Underwater, you are below the surface of the lake. It turns out that the lake is quite shallow and the bottom is only a few feet below you. Considering the frigid temperature of the water, you should probably not plan an extended stay. The lake bottom is sandy and a few hardy plants and algae live there. You catch a brief glimpse of something shiny in the sand. Now, because we've dropped the object, we're going to have to get out of the lake. And to do that, we need to go up to the top of the lake. And as you can see, the icy waters are taking their toll and we'll not be able to hold out much longer. And we're going to go to the west. And while we're here, we warm up. Now, you're on the western shore of the lake. The ground here is quite hard, but a few sickly reeds manage to grow near the water's edge. The only path leads into the rock to the south. So we're going to go in lake. And then we're going to go down again. And we're going to get the object. And it slipped out of our grasp again. So we're going to go up, and then we're going to go west. And then we're going to go in lake. And this is just a repeat game until we finally get it. You reach the shiny object. It's a simple golden amulet. Now we want to go back up. Now you see here where it says the icy waters are taking their toll. I know I have read this before, but you do not have a very long time. And once it says you are becoming very weak, leave the water before you drown. You have two turns to leave the water before you die. Now we want to go west from here to the western shore. And then we are going to go south to the scenic vista. 
You're in a small chamber carved in the rock with the sole exit to the north. Mounted on one wall is a table labeled Scenic Vista, whose featureless surface is angled toward you. One might believe that the table was used to indicate points of interest in the view from this spot, like those found in many parks. On the other hand, your surroundings are far from spacious, and by no stretch of the imagination could this spot be considered scenic. An indicator above the table reads 2. Mounted on the wall is a flaming torch, which fills the room with a flickering light. Now let's get the torch. And then we want to look at the table. The surface is a pale and featureless, but slowly an image takes shape. You see a tiny room with rough walls. Chiseled crudely on one wall is the number 8. The only apparent exit seems to be a blur. The image slowly fades. Now this is a teleportation device, but it not only travels through space, it almost feels like it travels through time, not in the game sense, but in a player sense, because if we touch the table, we are now in room eight. And you may not remember this, but room eight goes all the way back to Zork two. It's the room that was just west of the carousel room. This is a small chamber carved out of the rock at the end of a short crawl. On the wall is crudely chiseled the number 8. The only apparent exit to the east seems to be a blur, and a loud whirring sound resounds through the rock. A spray can is in the corner. In large type is the legend Froba's Magic Grew Repellent. We want to get the Grew Repellent. And then we play the waiting game. You f suddenly find yourself back in the viewing room. We want to wait. The indicator above the table flickers briefly, then changes to four. We do not want it to say four. We want it to say three. As you can see, what is going on is that it's taking us through the different Zorks. And it's very interesting that it can take us into Zork 4 for one turn. We wait. Time passes. There's a great tremor from within the earth. The entire dungeon shakes violently and loose debris falls from above. This is the thing I talked about early on in the opening, where we're not going to be in time for one of the events, and therefore it's going to close off one of the potential solutions to a puzzle for us, which is okay because we just picked up the Gru Repellent, which is another solution for it, and I personally prefer the Gru Repellent. We're going to wait. The indicator above the table flickers briefly and changes to one. We wait again. We wait again, and it changes to two. We wait. We wait. The indicator above the table flickers briefly and then changes to three. We're going to touch the table, and it takes us back to the damp passage. This is a particularly damp spot, even by dungeon standards. You can junction to the west in two similar passages to the east and northeast. A wide stone channel steeply descends into the room from the south. It is covered with slippery moss and lichen. The channel crosses the room, but the opening where it once continued is now blocked by rubble. That direction is the rubble that just fell in what just happened. So we are going to drop our torch now. And then we wait. And we are back in the viewing room. And we want to go north to the western shore. Now I told you, when we go into the lake, we drop what we're carrying. And we're going to get a chance to see that now by go in lake. The shock of entering the frigid water has made you drop all of your possessions into the lake on the lake. So we want to go down. Underwater, there's Froba's Magic Grew Repellent here. We want to get the Grew Repellent taken. And then we want to go south. Underwater, the icy waters are taking their toll. You will not be able to hold out much longer. Up on the lake, south to the southern shore. You're on the south shore of the lake. Rock formations prevent movement to the west, and a thickening swamp to the east makes the going all but impossible. To the south, where the beach meets a rock formation, you can make out a dark passage sloping steeply upward into the rock. Now here we want to use the Gru repellent. So apply Gru 
repellent to me. We're not going to spray the area with it. We're going to spray ourselves. That's because we're going into a dark area, and normally in a dark area, you're most likely to be eaten by a grill. We do not want to be eaten by a grill. The spray smells like a mixture of old socks and burning rubber. If I were a grill, I'd sure to stay clear. So now we continue going south. It's pitch black. I've already mapped this area out so I know where we are. We're going to go south again. There's a sinister gurgling noises in the darkness all around you. It's pitch black. The ground continues to slope upwards away from the lake. You can barely detect a dim light from the east. We want to go east. The key room. You're between some rock and a dark place. The room is lit dimly from above, revealing a lone dark path sloping down to the west. To one side of the room is a large manhole cover. The light from above seems to be focused on the center of the room, where a single key is lying in the dust. Now, if we were going to do this a different way, we would actually be going into the manhole. So we would need to move the cover, go down, and then we would go north and there's a high archway there. And we just keep going north and it takes us up an aqueduct where we could continue the game. But since we waited too long, the earthquake happened. This is not going to be there. The aqueduct is going to collapse and we cannot get through. That's why we're using the grew repellent, is so that we can get what we need here and head back without being eaten by a grew in the pitch black. So we need to get the key. The horrible smell is less pungent now. It is starting to wear off. And then we head back the direction we came from, which is west, and then we go north, and we go north again to the southern shore. So it is now light again, and here, we go in the lake and we drop the key because obviously the frigid water causes us to drop things. So we need to go down again. There's magic grew repellent and there's a strange key here. Let's get the key. It's ours for a moment, then it drops from our grasp. So we're going to go up and then we're going to go west to the western shore and then go in lake go down, get key, up, and we just play this game until we finally get it. Go back in the lake, down, get the key, and now we need to get out of here before this fish decides it wants us for dinner. And we do that by going up, and then we go north instead of west. I like to go west because it's easier for me to keep track of. And as you see, there's a bunch of things that we dropped here before, but we're going to leave most of them alone. For right now, we want the lamp. So we're not gonna head back the way we came from, back to the foggy room, which is north. Then we go north again to the creepy crawl, north again to the junction. Standing before us is a big rock. We're going to go east the damp passage. This is where we teleported to and dropped the torch. We want to get the torch. This is now going to be our alternate light source. And so we're going to head back out of here. And to do that, we're going to start by going west to the junction, south again to the creepy crawl, and then we're going to go east. This is a tight squeeze, a very low, narrow passage leading east to west. East again, to the crystal grotto. This is a chamber of breathtaking beauty. Mighty stalagmites form crystalline encrusted rock formations. Phosphorescent mosses fed by a trickle of water from above make the crystals glow and sparkle with every color of the rainbow. There is an opening to the west and a man-made passage heads south. Now we go south to the Royal Hall. This is the north end of a large hall with a vaulted ceiling. A long, tilted hallway leads north through a tall arch. Although the purpose of this room is unclear, there's a large rendering of the Royal Seal of Lord Dimwit Flathead carved in the wall. We want to go south again. The Great Door. This is the south end of a monumental hall full of debris from a recent earthquake. To the east is a great iron door, rusted shut. To its right, however, is a gaping cleft in the rock behind a cleared area. This is another timed thing that is opened up by the earthquake. So when it closes one path, it opens another path. We want to go through the cleft to the side, the gaping cleft in the rock behind. And to do that, we go east.
which puts us in the museum entrance. This is the entrance to the Royal Museum, the finest and grandest of the great underground empire. To the south, down a few steps, is the entrance to the Royal Puzzle, and to the east, through a stone door, is the Royal Jewel Collection. A lot of royals here. A wooden door to the north is open and leads to the Museum of Technology. To the west is a great iron door, rusted shut. To its left, however, is a cleft in the rock providing an exit from the museum. We want to go north. Technology Museum. This is a large hall which hosted the technological exhibits of the Great Underground Empire. A door to the south is open. Directly in front of you is a large golden machine, which has a seat with a console in front. On the console is a single button and the dial connected to a three-digit display, which reads 948. The machine is surprisingly shiny and shows few signs of age. A strange gray machine, shaped somewhat like a clothes dryer, is to one side of the room. On the other side of the hall, is a powerful looking black machine, a tight tangle of wires, pipes, and motors. A plaque is mounted near the door. The writing is faded, however, and cannot be made out clearly. The two machines seem to be in bad shape, rusting in many spots. Now we need to move the machine. So we're going to push the gold machine south. museum entrance. With some effort, you push the machine into the room with you. And then we want to open the stone door. The door is now open, and we want to push the machine east. You're in a high ceiling chamber, in the middle of which sits a tall, rounded steel cage, which is securely locked. In the middle of the cage is a pedestal on which sits the crown jewels of the great underground empire, a scepter, a jeweled knife, and a golden ring. A small bronze plaque now tarnished is in the cage. With some effort, you push the machine into the room with you. Now the solution to this puzzle is right in front of us. If we read the plaque, crown jewels presented to the Royal Museum by his gracious Lord, Demwit Flathead dedicated 777 GUE. This tells us we need to go before this was dedicated, before the cage was built. And to do that, we need to sit in the machine. We are now in the gold machine. Let's examine the machine. The machine consists of a seat and a console containing one small button and a dial connected to a display which reads 948. So let's change the dial. We're going to set it to 776 because 777 was when this was dedicated. The dial is set to 776 and then we push the button. You experience a brief period of disorientation. When your vision returns, your surroundings appear to have changed. From outside of the door, you hear the sounds of guards talking. You notice that everything you were holding is gone. You notice the golden machine has disappeared. Look there, by the way, right after the word returns, comma, your. That's a typo in the game. So let's get the ring, because it's still here. You are now wearing the golden ring. And then we want to open the door. You open the door ever so slightly and see dozens of armed officials. You shut the door quickly, realizing that you would be killed in an instant if you left the room. So we want to listen, because we need to know when they leave. The voices are muffled by the door, which, fortunately for you, separates you. They seem to be in a heated debate on the topic of torturing thieves. Let's listen some more. The voices are muffled by the door, which, fortunately for you, separate you. They seem to be in a heated debate on the topic of the soon-to-be-constructed royal puzzle. One particularly loud and grating voice can be heard above the others of the room. Very nice, very nice. Not enough security, but very nice. Now, Lord Feebness, pay attention. I've been thinking that we need a dam. A tremendous dam to control the frigid river with thousands of gates. We shall call it... Flood control dam number two. No, not quite right. Aha! Flood control dam number three. 
Pardon me, my lord, but wouldn't that just be tad excessive? Nonsense, now. Let me tell you my idea for hollowing out volcanoes. With that, the voices trail out nothingness. So let's go ahead and open the door again. You open the door ever so slightly and see dozens of armed officials. You shut the door quickly, realizing that you would be killed in an instant if you left the room. So let's listen to the guards some more. The voices are muffled, and they seem to be in a heated debate on the topic of the proper way to execute trespassers. Again, and they're talking about the banishment of the Wizard of Frobaz. Again, and they're back to the royal puzzle. Again, the excessive nature of the royal government. Again, on torturing thieves. Again, you hear from outside the guards marching away their voices fading. After a few moments, a booming crash signals the close of what must be a tremendous door. Then there is silence. Now let's try opening the door again. See, I wanted to show you that it wouldn't let you just open the door and walk into death. The door is now open, and we want to go west to the museum entrance. This appears to be an unfinished entranceway to the Royal Museum. There are doors to the east and north, and a blind stairway to the south. A heavy iron door to the west is closed and locked. Let's open the wooden door. The wooden door opens, and we're going to go north into the Technology Museum, in a large unfinished room probably intended to be part of the Royal Museum. A strange gray machine, shaped somewhat like a clothes dryer, is on one side of the room. On the other side of the hall is a powerful-looking black machine, a tight tangle of wires, pipes, and motors. A plaque mounted near the door. The gray machine, it turns out, is a Frobos magic pressurizer used in coal mines of the Empire. The black machine is a Frobos magic room spinner. The golden machine is referred to as a temporizer. All are non-working models donated by Frobaz co-president John D. Flathead. Directly in front of you is a large golden machine which has a seat with a console in front. On the console is a single button and a dial connected to a three-digit display which reads 776. The machine is surprisingly shiny and shows few signs of age. So let's have a look at the plaque. It's a pointless move, but we may as well have a look at it. The plaque merely identifies the machines and names their donor. They are non-working models of existing state-of-the-art machinery. That does us no good, but what we need to do is we need to have a way to get the ring out of here, back to ourselves, and we want it to go somewhere where they will not find it. So we're going to hide the ring under the seat. The ring is concealed underneath the seat. And now we need to waste a little bit of time because all we can do is wait. We could wander around, but I prefer the safety of this room. You start to feel lightheaded and quickly become completely disoriented. When your head clears, you realize that your surroundings have changed. So now let's get all. We want to get everything. So we get the golden amulet, the strange key, the lamp, and the torch. We're going to return. So we're going to open the stone door. Then we're going to go west to the museum entrance and open the wooden door. Go north, so we're back in the Technology Museum, and I've read this before, so we're not going to read it again. Instead, we're just going to look under the seat. You find the ring under the seat and put it on your finger. If we had attempted to hide it somewhere else, they would have found it. Now let's go south to the museum entrance, south again. This is the Royal Puzzle Entrance. This is a small square room, in the middle of which a round hole through which you can discern the floor, some ten feet below. The area under the hole is dark, but appears to be completely enclosed in rock. In any event, it doesn't seem likely that you could climb back up. Exits are west, and up a few steps north. Lying on the ground is a small note of some kind. So let's read the note. 
Warning, the royal puzzle is dangerous and it is possible to become trapped within its confines. Please do not enter the puzzle after hours when museum personnel are not present. The management. Drop the note. We're not carrying it. Notice in the game, previously, whenever we would read notes, we pick them up. But this time, we don't pick it up. We just read it. Now let's go down into the royal puzzle. Room in a puzzle. You're in a small square room bounded to the north and west with marble walls and to the east and south with sandstone walls. Now basically this is what is called a Sokoban puzzle, a warehouse keeper puzzle. It's a type of sliding puzzle and the object is to slide things around properly to place one of two ladders in the proper place to climb back out after obtaining the book that is the treasure. Now there is a door with a slot next to it that we will see, and it's an alternate exit. And in order to open that door, you just have to put the book in the slot. Of course, then you pay a penalty, which is the book, and you need the book in order to complete the game. So let's get started with this. And I'm not going to really go into detail of explaining every single thing we do here. Instead, we're just going to go ahead and push through it and you can pay attention and hopefully figure out on your own what we're doing. So we start by push east wall. And this is where it's going to explain to us how the puzzle works. The wall slides forward and you follow it. The architecture of this region is getting complex so that further descriptions will be diagrams of the immediate vicinity in a three by three grid. The walls here are rock, but of two different types, sandstone and marble. The following notations will be used. Dot dot is your position. We're the middle of the grid. MM is a marble wall, SS is a sandstone wall, and two question marks is unknown because it's blocked by walls. So we're in a room in a puzzle. As you can see, north is up, south is down, east is to the right, and west is to the left. We want to travel through here. So pay attention to what's going on in the puzzle as I walk us through it. This is a lot of steps that we're going to take, and each step is crucial that we get it right. Therefore, I need to focus on what we're doing instead of explaining things. Please forgive me for that in advance. So we're going to go south, and then we're going to go south again, which will now, we want to go south one more time. And as you see, there's a ladder here firmly attached to the west wall, and we're going to go east. See below us is a sandstone wall, so we're going to push south wall. And it slides forward, and we hear a soft snap from the wall behind where we were pushing. Now we want to go north, and go north again, and then we're going to go east. Our lamp is getting dimmer. And here, we want to push on the south wall again. Noticed here is the old book in a center of the floor that's noticeably depressed. So we want to get the book. So we're gonna push the south wall again. We're going to head east, and then we're going to head east, and then we're going to head north. And here we're going to push on the west wall. And we're going to go south, and then west, and then west again, and north. I wonder, hang on, northeast, let's try that. I've not tried this yet, I've just gone with basic directions. Oh, that saves me time. That's very good. Thank you for suggesting that. Now, what we want to do is we want to push on the south wall. We are now going to take a moment while I modify all my notes. And thank you for waiting. Let's go southwest. And then we are going to push on the east wall. And then we are going to go northeast. Push on the south wall, northwest, north, north, north. Push on the east wall, southwest, south, southeast, northeast, north. Push on the west wall northwest and push on the south wall. And
push on the south wall again. West. Northwest. Northwest. Push on the south wall. Southeast. Southeast. Southeast, northeast, push on the west wall, push on the west wall again, southwest, push on the north wall, Push on the north wall again, and push on the north wall again, and then we go northwest. In the ceiling above you is a large circular opening. There is a ladder here, firmly attached to the east wall. Let's go up. With the help of the ladder, you exit the puzzle, Royal Puzzle Entrance. Lying on the ground is a small note of some kind. Now there are many different ways to complete that puzzle, and I have to admit, I did get a little bit of help from a friend who helped me map that out and figure out which directions we needed to go in order to do things, and I hope that doesn't break too many of the rules of me doing these games. Anyway, now we need to head north, and then west to the Great Door, and then we're going to go north to the Royal Hall, north again, to the Crystal Grotto, where we go west, to the Tight Squeeze, west again, to the Creepy Crawl, south to the Foggy Room, and south back to the Lake Shore, where we had dropped everything. And here we want to get all. Remember we left it all before? Now we're going to get it all. And you see, we're wearing the hood, we're wearing the cloak, we've grabbed the staff and the vial and the piece of way bread. And now we want to head a different direction. So we're going to go north to the foggy room, north again to the creepy crawl, north again to the junction with the great rock where we go east to the damp passage and then northeast. You're in the room with passages heading southwest and southeast. The north wall is ornately carved, filled with strange runes and writing in unfamiliar language. An old wizened man is huddled asleep in the corner. He is snoring loudly and looks quite weak and frail. So we want to wake the old man. The old man is roused to consciousness. He peers at you through eyes, which appears much younger and stronger than his frail body, and waits, as if expecting something to happen. So let's give bread to the old man. He looks up at you and takes the whey bread. Slowly he eats the bread and pauses when he is finished. He starts to speak. Perhaps what you seek is through there. He points at the carved wall to the north, where you now notice the bare outline of a secret door. When you turn back, the old man is gone. So let's open the door. The massive stone door opens noiselessly. Beyond the secret door are dark, forbidding stairs leading down to a passage below. Flickering torchlight illuminates the passage. So let's go north. Button room. You're at the southern end of a long hall. To the south, stairs ascend into the darkness. To the north, the corridor is illuminated by torches set high in the walls, out of reach. On one wall is a red button. Let's go north again. Beam room. You're in the middle of a long north-south corridor whose walls are polished stone. A narrow red beam of light crosses the room at the north end, inches above the floor. The corridor continues north and south. Now we want to break this beam. We're going to use the lamp to do it. The beam is now interrupted by a lamp laying on the floor. And then we're going to go back south to the button room. Remember there's one button here? So we're going to push the button. Click, snap, and go back north to the beam room. There's a large lamp here. And get the lamp. And then we're going to go north 
to the hallway. This is part of the long hallway. The east and west walls are dressed stone. In the center of the hall is a shallow stone channel. In the center of the room, the channel widens into a large hole around which is engraved a compass rose. The hallway continues to the south. A large mirror fills the north side of the hallway. The mirror is mounted on a panel which has been opened outward. And we're going to go north one more time. We are inside the mirror. You are inside a rectangular box of wood whose structure is rather complicated. Four sides and the roof are filled in, and the floor is open. As you face the side opposite the entrance, two short sides of carved and polished wood are to your left and right. The left panel is mahogany, the right pine. The wall you face is red on its left half and black on its right. On the entrance side, the wall is white opposite the red part of the wall it faces, and yellow opposite the black section. The painted walls are at least twice the length of the unpainted ones. The ceiling is painted blue. That's a lot of information to give us. In the floor is a stone channel about six inches wide and a foot deep. The channel is oriented in the north-south direction. In the exact center of the room, the channel widens into a circular depression perhaps two feet wide. Incised in the stone, Around this area is a compass rose. Running from one short wall to the other, at about waist height is a wooden bar, carefully carved and drilled. This bar is pierced in two places. The first hole is in the center of the bar, and thus the center of the room. The second is at the left end of the room, as you face opposite the entrance. Through each hole runs a wooden pole. The pole at the left end of the bar is short, extending about a foot above the bar, and ends in a hand grip. The pole has been dropped into a hole carved into the stone floor. The long pole at the center of the bar extends from the ceiling through the bar to the circular area in the stone channel. This bottom end of the pole has a T-bar a bit less than two feet long attached to it, and on the T-bar is carved an arrow. The arrow and the T-bar are pointing west. That is a lot more information, and there are multiple solutions to this. I'm going to use the one that I like the most because it requires a lot less explanation. So let's go ahead. So instead of attempting to move the mirror box, we're going to use the vial that we got from the sailor. So to do this, we need to lift the short pole. The pole is now slightly above the floor, and then we're going to push the white panel. Remember, my keyboard sometimes doubles the N. The structure rotates counterclockwise. The arrow on the compass rose now indicates southwest. The mirror quietly swings shut. We're going to push the white panel again. The structure rotates counterclockwise. The arrow on the compass now indicates south. So let's lower the short pole. pole is lowered into the channel and then push on the pine panel. The pine wall swings open. Now north. As you leave, the door swings shut. Hallway. This is part of the long hallway. The east and west walls are dressed stone. In the center of the hall is a shallow stone channel. In the center of the room, the channel widens into a large hole around which is engraved a compass rose. Somewhat to the north, identical stone statues face each other from pedestals on opposite sides of the corridor. The statues represent guardians of Zork, a military order of ancient lineage. They are portrayed as heavily armored warriors clasping formidable bludgeons. The south side of the room is divided by a wooden wall into small hallways to the southeast and southwest. Now we are going to open the vial. The vial is open. There is a sweet odor from within the vial, apparently coming from a heavy but invisible liquid. That's our clue to what this liquid does. We're going to drink the liquid. You drink the contents in one gulp, but nothing unusual seems to have happened as a result. And now we're going to go north. This is part of the long hallway. 
the east and west walls are dressed stone in the center of the hall is a shallow stone channel in the center of the room the channel widens into a large hole around which is engraved a compass rose on either side of you are identical stone statues holding bludgeons they appear ready to strike though for the moment they remain impassive this is because we are invisible if we had done this without the invisibility potion in the vial we would be dead the corridor continues north and south we're going to go north again this is part of the long hallway the east and west walls are dressed stone in the center of the hall is a shallow stone channel in the center of the room the channel widens into a large hole around which is engraved a compass rose somewhat to the south identical stone statues face each other from pedestals on opposite sides of the corridor the statues represent the guardians of zork a military order of ancient lineage they are portrayed as heavily armored warriors clasping formidable bludgeons the corridor continues to the north I'm not going to read everything from here in until we get to the end of this hallway. We're at the dungeon entrance. You are in a north-south hallway which ends to the north at a large wooden door. The corridor continues south. The wooden door has a barred panel in it about head height. The door itself is closed. So let's knock on the door. The knock reverberates along the hall. For a time, it seems there will be no answer. Then you hear someone unlatching the small panel. Through the bars of the great door, the wrinkled face of an old man appears. He starts to smile broadly and opens the massive door without a sound. The old man motions, and you feel yourself drawn towards him. I am the master of the dungeon, he booms. I have been watching you closely during your journey through the great underground empire. Yes! he says as if recalling some almost forgotten time we have met before although i may not appear as i did then you look closely into his deeply lined face and see the faces of the old man by the sacred door your friend at the cliff and the hooded figure you have shown kindness to the old man and compassion toward the hooded one you displayed patience in the puzzle and trust at the cliff you've demonstrated strength ingenuity and valor however one final test awaits you now command me as you will and complete your quest narrow corridor you're in a narrow north south corridor at the south end is a door and at the north end is an east west corridor the door is closed the dungeon master is quietly leaning on his staff here so now we are going to go north to the south corridor you're in an east west corridor which turns north at its eastern and western ends the walls are made of the finest marble another hall leads south at the center of the corridor the dungeon master follows you going to go west to the west corridor this is a hall with polished marble walls it widens slightly as it turns east at its northern and southern ends the dungeon master follows you he's just going to keep following us until we tell him not to this is a wide east-west corridor which opens into a northern parapet at its center. You can see the flames and smoke as you peer towards the parapet. The corridor turns south at either end, and in the center of the south wall is a heavy wooden door with a small barred window. The door is closed. I'm going to go north again. We are at the parapet. You are standing behind a stone retaining wall which rims a parapet overlooking a fiery pit. It is difficult to see through the smoke and flame which fills the pit, but it seems to be bottomless. The pit itself is circular, about 200 feet in diameter, and is fashioned of roughly hewn stone. The flames generate considerable heat, so it is rather uncomfortable standing here. There is an object here which looks like a sundial. On it are an indicator arrow surrounding a large button. On the face of the dial are the numbers 1 through 8. The indicator points to the number one. To the south, across a narrow corridor, is a prison cell. Now, this dial allows us to select rooms from a carousel of rooms inside the cells that we just passed. So we want to turn the dial to four and push the button. The dial now points to four. The button depresses with a slight click and pops back. Four is the one that we want. Now we're going to tell the dungeon master to stay. The dungeon master answers, I will stay. We're going to go south. So we're back in the north corridor and we want to open the door. The cell door opens, and we go south. 
You're in a featureless prison cell. You can see an east-west corridor outside the cell door. Your view also takes in the parapet and a large fiery pit. The dungeon master is at the parapet, leaning on his staff. His keen gaze is fixed on you, and he looks tense as if waiting for something to happen. Behind you, to the south, is a bronze door, which is closed. Now we want to tell the dungeon master... to turn the dial... To one and push the button. If you wish, he replies. You're in a bare prison cell. Its wooden door is securely fastened and you can see only flames and smoke through its small window. On the south wall is a bronze door which seems to be closed. You notice that the cell door is now closed. Let's unlock the bronze door with the key. The key seems to mold itself to the shape of the lock. With a mere twist of your hand, the massive bolt gives way. Let's open the bronze door. On the other side of the bronze door is a narrow passage, which opens into a larger area. Then we're going to go south through the bronze door. Treasury of Zork. This is a large room, richly appointed in a style that bespeaks exquisite taste. To judge from its contents, it is the ultimate storehouse of the wealth of the great underground empire. There are chests containing precious jewels, mountains of Zork myths, rare paintings, ancient statuary, and beguiling curios. On one wall is an annotated map of the empire showing locations of the various troves of treasure and of many superior scenic views. On a desk at the far end of the room are stock certificates representing a controlling interest in Frobos Co. International, the multinational conglomerate and parent company of Frobos Magic Boat Company, etc. As you examine your newfound riches, the Dungeon Master materializes beside you and says, Now that you have solved all the mysteries of the dungeon, it is time for you to assume your rightfully earned place in the scheme of things. Long have I waited for one capable of releasing me from my burden. He taps you lightly on the head with his staff, mumbling a few well-chosen spells, and you feel yourself changing, growing older and more stooped. For a moment, there are two identical mages standing amongst the treasure, a sardonic grin on his face. For a moment, you are relieved, safe in the knowledge that you have at last completed your quest in Zork. You begin to feel the vast powers and lore at your commanding a thirst for an opportunity to use them. Your potential is 7 out of a possible 7 in 318 moves. I do think it is interesting that he says, freed him from his burden, which means you now hold the burden of being the dungeon master. You've also grown older and you're stooping over, so you're the classic dungeon master image of somebody who is not in good health. This concludes our Zork games on the TRS-80 Model 1. Do I have thoughts about them? To be honest, I've put so much time into them over the past year, I'm a bit burned out on all things Zork. They're definitely products of their time. They're the pinnacle of what could be done in their day, and they show it. And sadly, one of the things they do not leave room for is for someone to have done it better. Time has already told us who came out on top, even though... Scott Adams showed us it could be done. Infocom came along and showed us exactly how to do it better. No, how to do it the best. Now, I said there was a different solution to some of the puzzles, and one in particular, the mirror box puzzle. And we're going to be using that other solution when we run through that game on the Coco together. Now, that said, I want to take a moment and point out something that I really sh have not shared before, and I probably should have. I know, I truly know that you could be anywhere you want to be at this moment, doing anything you choose. And I'm honored that out of all of your possible choices, you've chosen to be here doing this with me. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. So comment, like, subscribe, request, you know how it works. Thank you. Take care of yourselves and each other, and I look forward to our next adventure together.